Hello, welcome to episode eight of Open Educator with Dr. Steve Diazio. We have a wonderful set of programming today. We're going to have our real life spy come and talk to us about what we can learn from being an everyday spy and his journey as an entrepreneur and alum from the MBA program here at USF. But before we do that, I would like to mention that there's three main pathways within the entrepreneurship program here at USF. Of course, the entrepreneurship and innovation program prepares students to develop and create their own businesses. And if you walk down downtown St. Pete or Tampa, you will find loads of businesses that uh, students and alumni have started in the entrepreneurship program. And starting businesses is a very important uh, job uh, for helping our economy and creating new economic growth. But we also encourage students and train students to be innovators and creatives and on internal entrepreneurs of an organization. And this could be for large companies, Amazon, Apple, Google, Jable, Tech Data. So you also need to have an entrepreneurial and innovative mindset uh, to work and be a product manager, developer, et cetera, for these, for these companies. And lastly, the third main path is to empower students to create careers defined, not careers or paths that other people that define them for them. For instance, other majors might do that. And here we have another example of uh, an entrepreneur, uh, USF alum, an, uh, uh, one who has also worked in industry and taken that, those lessons to create their own business and create their own path and create their own journey that we'll learn from. But before we get to our guest speaker, let's do some warm up. Soft skills are very important. And what better way to practice these soft skills than working with our improv facilitator and trainer, Christine Alexander. So Christine, please give us a big warm up. Thank you. Sure, you're welcome. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Christine Alexander. I do improv. And today, uh, we're just going to be a little silly. First thing we're going to do is shake out our body. And um, so we're going to shake out one arm eight times. Then we're going to shake out the other arm eight times. Then we're going to go real slow with our body eight times. Then we'll tap a foot eight times. Then the other foot eight times, then we'll start all over. Four, four, two, 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 one, one. Just watch me and count out loud. All right, let's just be silly in this moment. Ready? <gasps> Tyler wins all the money. That was fast. That was too fast. <laughs> Sorry. I'm glad that you, you kept up. I'm so impressed with you. You win a million dollars. Uh, the Sweet. second game we're going to play is, and let's see here. Um, I see Marshall, then Alexa, then Graham, then Andrew, if you're playing, uh, Oliver, and Tyler. So Tyler, you go last, and Steve, you're going to go first, okay? We're going to do a game called uh, Yay Yahoo. I'm, it's just a word association game, just to get our minds wa warmed up. I'm going to say a word, any word. And we are all going to do this. Yay! So I'll say a word. Pizza. And then we all go, yay! yay! And then Steve says a word. Any word? Go ahead. Thanksgiving. And then we go, Yahoo! Yahoo. And punch Yahoo. it out. And then the next one will be yay. And the next one, Yahoo! Yay, Yahoo! So, uh, Marshall, you're next. Give me a word. Oh, oh, sorry, sleep. Yay! Yay. <laughs> and Alexa, any word? Pineapples. Yahoo! Oh. <laughs> and Graham. Dinosaurs. Yay! Yay. <laughs> and Andrew. <laughs> Coffee. Yahoo! Yahoo! Oliver. Christmas tree. Yay! Yay. Oh, one more 
more time. Um, balloons. Yahoo. Yahoo. Oh, Tyler, Yahoo. I missed you. <laughs> Tyler, your turn. Water. Yay. 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 Steve. Electrolyte. Yeah. Yahoo. 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 Oh, turkey. Yay! Yay! Yay. Alexa. <clears throat> Old weather. Yahoo! 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 Freedom. Yahoo! Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Andrew! Football! Yahoo! Yahoo! Oliver! Cat! Yay! Yay. Laundry! Yahoo! Yahoo. You guys, we did it. This crazy little nut game, we did it. And I love the person who said Yahoo. <laughs> because literally, it doesn't matter what word you say. You did so great. We're going to play one more game, which is we're going to tell a story. Okay. Um, I'm going to start the story. And then, Tyler, you're going to listen to the very last word I said and use the last letter of that word as your first word. First letter to your word. Oh boy. I know. <laughs> so then Tyler, we're, after Tyler, it's going to go Marshall, Alexa, Andrew, Graham, Oliver, and then Steve, just like we were doing before. Okay, so I'll start going to Tyler. Here we go. Right. Once upon a time, there was a hippopotamus who was lonely. Why was he lonely, you ask? Because he had no friends and no friendship. Friendship is always a nice thing to have. Everyone should make friends. Friends to you, Andrew. So he went looking to make new friends. Graham. So he went and didn't find any friends. Oliver, wrap it up. So uh, <laughs> go make some friends. Yes. Yes, Oliver. I'm so proud of you. Like all of a sudden, all of the weight of the entire story was on you and you just wrapped it up so awesomely. So you guys, we just did awesome improv. I'm so proud of you and I'm so grateful to be here and have a wonderful session. Learn how to spy. <laughs> Thank you, Christine. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Now that we had a warm up, each one of those games tied to a different soft skill that we try to teach uh, that connect improv and, and business or improv and innovation. If it's storytelling, if it's listening and awareness, if it's even just being prepared physically and getting your mind right. So with that, I would like to uh, change it up a little bit and introduce our guest. And I'm very grateful to Andy Bustamante is here to share from ex CIA spy, USF MBA alum, entrepreneur of Everyday Spy, and a real 007 visiting our class. So Andy, thank you. I want to start off by asking you, uh, first, thank you for being with us on the best place to be on a Tuesday morning. Uh, can Maybe you can give us a, an update on what you've been doing, uh, as connected, maybe uh, lay the groundwork. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me, uh, Dr. Diazio. So for those of you who are on the phone, Steve's an old friend of mine. Steve, we met like three years ago down in St. Pete and uh, connected right away over a shared passion for travel, some shared experience around the world. Um, for those of you who don't know Steve's educational background, he was one of those people who actually executed an operation that I've been trying to execute for a long time, where you get your you get an advanced degree overseas in a country that pays for your advanced degree. So, I mean, right out of the gate, Steve, I've respected you from the beginning and I loved learning with you at USF and I'm really happy that these students get to learn with you too. But enough about you, let's talk about me, right? That was your question. So I run everydayspy.com. I also am the host of the Everyday Espionage podcast. And really what I've been focused on for the last probably three to six months is how to continue my growth cycle 
in the middle of a global pandemic with record breaking unemployment. And when my avatar, my target customer base has basically refocused their resources on kind of long-term survival and preservation. And I know we have a plan to get to that avatar later, uh, Steve, so I don't want to jump on that. But uh, what that has forced me to do is it's forced me to kind of take my digital platform in different directions to try to increase engagement and to try to increase uh, resale lifetime customer value opportunities with existing customers. So it's one thing whenever you're trying to get new traffic in the door, it's a completely different thing when you're trying to sell new products to existing customers. Uh, it's like, you know, it, Nike doesn't have to figure it out because they just keep selling Nike shoes to new Nike customers. Uh, but it's a, it's a little bit different if you're something like USF, right? USF uh, doesn't always get to ascend every undergraduate to a master's level program or every master's level student to a PhD program. So that ascension gets much more narrow. Maybe how can you share a bit about how you, your journey evolved from, I don't know, uh, I know you were at CVS Health and then you had some other ventures and now, you know, this uh, new venture and Everyday Spy and publishing platform has really taken off. Maybe you could share a little bit about uh, how those intertwined or how that journey evolved for you. Yeah, absolutely. So it's funny, um, for anybody out there who thinks that you're a failure, if you try a business and the business doesn't work, I would say that, that that entire experience of failing at business is really just a filtering process to wash out all the non-entrepreneurs and let real entrepreneurs continue through. It's, that's, that's how I see the giant sieve. So when I was the agency, a big piece of what we did at the agency was we executed covert operations around the world through a commercial platform, through some kind of a seemingly for-profit business, but that for-profit business was covered in the back end with tax dollars. So, you know, if you just like the movies make it look, you can you can make any business spring up out of nowhere if you borrow a couple million dollars from the U.S. government treasury and then assign it to national security. So as I supported and executed these operations around the world, I learned about business and I realized that there is an infinite potential to make money and to live whatever life you want to live if you are in business. But here I was in government, which is very limiting and very strict and very structured. So after I had my first child, my wife and I chose to leave and we entered into the corporate arena. We entered into the corporate arena because it was the most easy transition for us from government to another structured environment in corporate America. And I wanted a, a kind of a staging ground to test my theories about using espionage in everyday life using tools and techniques for things like uh, things like persuasion, negotiation, uh, sales process, marketing, targeting. I wanted to take all of those skills and use them in the real world instead of just in spy life. So that's how we got into CVS Health. Once everything proved out in CVS Health, then I made the, biz the jump into business. And my first like three entrepreneurial ventures were just a total bust um, and a big Part of that bust, I think, was the learning curve of trying to figure out how to actually start something from zero. It's easy to start something when the government gives you $5 million to go start something. It is not easy to start something when you're reaching into your own pockets and you pull out some loose change. So um, we started with a LLC that was for consulting. And all we did was help business or help people uh, kind of uh, learn how to think differently, right? That was our whole thing. We're former CIA officers, we'll teach you how to think differently. Uh, and there's just enough people out there that we turned a profit in the first year. But that first year was basically just a, the expense of opening an LLC. So once we covered that first $300 <laughs> LLC cost, we were basically in the red or in the black, so it was good to go. Um, but then from there, I wanted to try and get something that was more sustainable, something where I could hire and create a staff. So we moved into the actual marketing of a product. We started with an emesis bag. If you don't know what an emesis bag, it's basically like a medical grade vomit bag. It's not a very pleasant sounding thing, but it is actually an important product in the world. Uh, the, and then we were able to create, engineer, have the entire thing manufactured, all the packaging and everything done through an overseas manufacturer by communicating through channels in China. Um, we can go into that if you want to, Steve, later. Uh, in the long run, marketing failed. I was able to create something that worked and we had you know, a dedicated following, but when you're selling a low price item, you have to sell in volume in order to make up your revenue. We weren't able to sell in that volume, so we had to abandon that project. 
when I say abandon, this is another beautiful thing about business. We still pay to keep the business alive and we still have stock in inventory. Uh, we have both of those things still standing and we still have a presence online growing you know, its own SEO uh, for longevity, but we haven't turned on the marketing effort to start reselling. And then after that, of experience with low ticket items and physical products and the whole manufacturing cycle, that's where we moved to digital products. And there was a, a little bit of a, some personal growth I needed before I made the jump to pers to digital products, but we can talk about that some other time. But my point is that's how we got to Everyday Spy. Instead of creating a physical product, I create a digital product. I never have inventory and my expenses are almost nil. Wonderful, Andy. What really resonated with me, and hopefully the students are able to make this connection, one of the courses that they're engaged in is a course called Scalability. And Scalability has its own history, but it's also evolved. The thought process frameworks and theories around scalability has changed. And today it's known as more of this continuous learning or institutional learning or organizational learning. And that's the new model of scaling opposed to just marketing or how to grow grow more customers but this iterative process of learning and clearly you've demonstrated that regardless of where you are at you know in the agency at cvs uh trying to do your consulting trying to sell a physical product and now selling a digital product on a platform you've had and you through your language and what you shared there's this continuous learning process and growth process so I'm really happy that that's been able to be accented so that we, the students can see because they're, they're working on a similar project where they're going through this iterative cycle of learning, testing, research. What role has, has research or identifying a target market played for you? And maybe can you share a bit how you go about doing that? Yeah, absolutely. Our, um, just to kind of piggyback on your scaling uh, your scaling point right there, scaling is everything in business. Uh, nothing else matters as much as being able to scale. Anybody can sell one thing. Anybody might get lucky enough to sell a dozen things, right? But if you can't scale in size, you'll never capture the efficiencies that come from reducing your costs. You'll never have a sustainable platform. You'll never be able to offset the amount of time you have to put into the business in exchange for the revenue that comes in. You'll always be working 15 hour days for $70,000 in revenue. If you want to get to the place where you're working a two hour day for $2 million in revenue, you have to scale. And that's for me, if, if the business doesn't scale, then it's not a business I want to be in. So let me uh, kind of jump from there into how, how we're trying to scale, right? And how we're trying to scale is, is tied very, very closely to your question about a target market and how we research our target market. So uh, every product at a very basic level, every product should solve some kind of a problem whether that problem is male pattern baldness or whether that pattern is hangnails or whether that pattern is gray hair or whatever it might be, every problem or every product should solve some kind of a problem. When you find, when you think of the solution that you're creating, your target market is the market that has that problem. I have a three-year-old and a seven-year-old. That means that I have all sorts of problems that people don't have if they don't have a seven-year-old or they don't have a three-year-old. If they have a 13 year old, they still don't have my problems. So when I think about a product that I'm trying to create, so as an example, I have a product that teaches people to rapidly gain influence and leverage that influence in the workplace to get a promotion, right? That's, that is the problem I'm solving. How do you get a promotion without having to go get a new degree, without having to go get some expensive certification? How do you get a promotion in 30 days right now? Like, and start immediately. If you're not in a job that gives promotions, then you're not part of my target audience. If you're not hungry for a promotion, you're not part of my target audience. If you're so old or if you've got the mindset that you've given up hope on ever getting promoted, you're not part of my target Did we lose Andy? I think so. I think he'll jump right on. Yeah. 
I thought I was frozen for a second. Same. Yeah. Because <laughs> sometimes I cut out, so I have to wait a few seconds. Can we start to see why identifying the problem, and I've repeated that over and over and over of why it's so important? Because if we don't have a clear, you know, e easily identify a clear problem, then we might be shooting for the wrong target or we're working things backwards. And this is why this iterative process, I say you got to refine, refine and clarify the problem. One, so we can learn because we want to test and be agile. But if we don't identify the problem correctly the first time, then we're, we are not, you know, being efficient. So Andy just came back. Hey, hey, Steve, Batman. Sure, no, no problem. Um, I just shared a bit about, I, the, over the, every course that they take, I really hound them on the idea, the importance of problem, problem identification. And if you don't have a good problem statement or identify the problem clearly to your connection, you, you can't identify the audience. And I know right before uh, we paused, you were talking about who is in your target audience and maybe you want to pick up from there. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, I mean, just to kind of cut to the chase a little bit better, um, I take a look at everything, every product that I, every service or product that I can create, I look at that, the problem that it's solving, and then I start to build a, an ideal customer. And my ideal customer, who I call an avatar, is the person who is the most distressed by that specific problem. So for example, in the, in the example I was giving you about the, the influence and income product that I generate, it's a product called Influential Income. My target audience for that is a, is a named individual. I actually create a full-blown persona. His name is Paul. Paul is 42 years old. Paul has been working since he was 20, 22 years old. He's been working 20 years. He's still 30, he's still 15 years away from any hope of retirement. He's got two kids. They're about the same age as my kids. He's been married for seven years. Like, you know, Paul has an advanced degree, but he's, you know, stuck at like an $85,000 a year salary. I can tell you what hobbies Paul has. I can tell you what Paul's background experience looks like. I can tell you what Paul does on the weekends. I feel like I am friends with a guy named Paul. And at the center of Paul's pain is the fact that he can't make more money in his existing job. That's the process that we go through to, to identify and name our target audience. If, if we sell to somebody who's a derivation of Paul, maybe it's Paulette, or maybe it's somebody who's two years younger than Paul or five years older than Paul or has one extra kid, that's cool. That's all gravy. My goal is to find every Paul out there and make sure he or he is aware of the solution that we have created. Wonderful. In fact, in our student consulting class, we create personas because one of the tools within design thinking and the methodology we're using for consulting is creating personas. So we see this example for Andy's business of how by knowing that customer, by embodying that customer, creating a visual, creating that story about Paul, uh, you're able to always have your aim on that target market and create value props or different omni channels to reach that type of Paul. Um, I would also like to ask, is there any research that you do in advance to help you determine who your target market or who your Paul is? Yeah, Maybe absolutely. Share a bit, a bit about that, because yeah. research is a big part of our projects, but it's not always things that we learn good skills or often spend much time in, in university doing. So maybe you could share a bit how you identify that persona or that avatar. Yeah, and you actually you asked for that, so I'm sorry, Steve, to to bulldoze over the research part. Um, so when I when I look for a target audience, it starts with the problem, and then from there I start to grow out. I go to the uh, I go to the library, the open internet, the the World Wide Web, however you want to call it, but I go looking to confirm whether or not my target audience actually has the problem I think they have. It's very easy to think that you have a, a great solution to a problem it against open source information, you don't know whether or not that problem really exists. So one of the first things I'll always do is I will turn to business journals. 
and I'll look at trends that are happening in the uh, in the product range, or rather in the income range of the target that I'm trying to hit. I don't want to hit. I'm not trying to. Paul does not make less than thirty five thousand dollars a year. I don't really care what's happening in the market for people who make less than thirty five thousand dollars a year. I will target right away what is happening in the business environment. You know, in for products in a certain price range that I want to compete in with individuals who have a certain level of education, with a certain level of income, and I'll dig in there first. If I find out that the problem I'm trying to solve is not a problem they have, I just adjust the problem. I adjust the solution because every time you go out and start researching, you learn something new. A lot of times you'll find that the product that you're, the, the solution you're trying to create might be too complicated, or the solution is not really set for the person you're trying to, uh, you want to target. Your ideal customer has to change because of the solution that you're trying to build. So business journals are excellent. Uh, I also really like using bloggers. I like using uh, bloggers in terms of saturation of the content that they're creating. If I find 5,000 people out there talking about being frustrated by their job, then I know that's a very common problem. But if I go out there and I can't find something, if I do a Google search on why trash bags always tear, if I don't find dozens of pages telling me about how to fix trash bags tearing, then I, I know that that's not really a problem people have. So it's about saturation of content. It's about what you see in professional peer vetted journals. And then from there, it's really just numerics, like actual empirical data that you can find through the Bureau of Labor Statistics, through uh, proprietary channels. If you, if you subscribe to some of the online uh, metrics and statistics uh, platforms that are out there like uh, Statistia, and then that's pretty much, that's more or less the research that I do before I start going actually and using prototypes in the market. Wonderful. With those prototypes, do you go out and test them and get primary data? Because that's also a requirement for our class is to learn how to do primary research through many different mechanisms, regardless if you're using a prototype or creating a survey to understand the market, but with primary data. Where do, yeah. What role does that play? Absolutely. I'm, I mean, thanks for continuing it on in that direction. So yeah, once I have uh, an idea from raw data, then I will start testing my market through surveys. I've got dedicated fans, previous people who have, so, who have purchased from me. Uh, I know Paul is already on my list because I've sold to Paul before. So I'll start going out with survey data. I'll go out with kind of like a, what I call a freemium product, which is a half-baked prototype but they get it for free and the whole goal is just to kind of get feedback from it just to see how people respond see the engagement levels and then once i get that primary data from a survey confirming that i'm solving a problem people have and then i see the response and engagement to a freemium half-baked product then i know it's worth my time it's worth my effort it's worth my advertising dollars to bake the whole thing out and then push it uh, to, to a cold audience Wonderful. So this is learning through the market, reducing costs, reducing risk, so you can maximize uh, the time, money, and effort that you're putting into the next round of prototypes or learning that really takes place. So thank you for sharing that, Andy. You have mentioned all the different and unique experiences, if it's in a government agency, which we don't always often connect that experience to working in um, a big corporation to starting your own consulting to making a product and manufacturing that and then now a digital um i'm wondering if if there's been a thread or, or a woven woven um connection for instance has how has being a spy helped you be an entrepreneur if so and or being an entrepreneur you think would help you be a better spy if you're not a still a spy <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, the place that I'm going to start with that is by saying that uh, being an entrepreneur has allowed me to better understand the concepts that I was using already in espionage. It's kind of like you learn how to cook, so then you start to cook things, but until you're cooking for a family or cooking for a paycheck, you don't really master the skill of cooking. You're like, oh yeah, it's not hard to you know, throw a couple things together and make it work. Um, and then I would also say that my entire business concept hedges on the fact that espionage can make people better at business. That's, that is my, that's the center of everything that Everyday Spy stands for, that espionage skills 
can give you a unique and unfair advantage in multiple aspects of everyday life, whether it's business or whether it's relationships or whether it's whatever else. So I am gambling my entire family's well-being on the, the latter half of your question. And I am most certainly seeing the first half come true. And here's some of the some of the specific areas. I have a high risk tolerance. And that's because the agency taught me a mindset to accept risks and to label risks as objective or subjective. Meaning is a risk actually as potentially catastrophic as I think it is, or am I getting tied up in the feelings of a catastrophic failure? So for example, uh, when our emesis bag, when we ended up with a closet or like a storage unit full of these $1 emesis bags and no market to sell to, that was, that's the kind of thing that many people like, they feel intense failure at a point like that. Thousands of dollars in inventory that can't be turned over, that can't be sold. I just failed in my business. Well, thanks to the the training, the mindset training at the agency, plus you know a, a good MBA uh, from USF, I realized objectively that the inventory is a sunk cost. It's all tax deductible. It you know it decreases in value over time, but it can be offset. So it's not really as catastrophic a failure. Plus, it's a it's a lesson in how not to do business in the future. So it's it's all about how you process through that information. That's something that the agency taught me with risk management, risk tolerance that I've been able to apply in the business world. And then in the business world, when it comes to that whole concept we had with targeting Paul, build problem solution, that is such powerful, like uh, just priceless perspective on business that I use that still to this day when I get called in to do any kind of private intelligence contract, which the US government and foreign governments still call us in to do private intelligence. When we go and we serve a private intelligence function, we can take that that whole concept of problem solution and uh, understanding your avatar, and we can use it to maximize our negotiating power, our uh, our persuasive techniques against a client, winning repeat business over time. It's just it's this beautiful kind of double edged sword that's working in our favor. I liked how you framed the idea of risk mindset. In fact, within academia, since there's there's still a lot to be learned and known about entrepreneurs or what makes them different than anyone else. And there's a whole area of research around this idea of, of risk tolerance or um, risk mindset or risk mitigating mindset. So the historic or myth about entrepreneurs is that they're just mavericks, they go out and, and they're just you know, doing whatever. But in fact, this area of research known through effectuation is about this idea of what am I willing to risk or accept risk for whatever type of venture. And it's a different mindset than the historical or the, the myth busting or myth that they've had about the mindset of the cognitive per perspective of the of the entrepreneur. So that's interesting that you framed it like that. And let me let me just jump in and pile onto that, Steve, because the, the terminology we use in the agency is called leveraging risk. Essentially, you're turning risk into a weapon that other people don't have, and we leverage it, right? It's all about how much risk are you willing to take in order to do the thing that other people aren't willing to risk failing at, and that's the process of leveraging it, just like you would leverage debt or just like you would leverage uh, some sort of physical, personal skill. If you have a tolerance for risk and the guy sitting next to you has less tolerance for risk, you can defeat that person if you leverage your risk as an advantage against them. And that is, I mean, that's how covert operations run all around the world. And it's just, it's brilliant when you see it come to life in entrepreneurial business. Cool. So I'd like to prime the students, you know, I'm gonna ask Andy, uh, we're gonna continue our discussion, but think about if you guys have a question or, or uh, comments that you would like to share. So before we get into that, I know that you've you've developed you know a lot of personal skills, um, soft and hard skills over your journey. But is there something that sticks out or that you've developed recently that you you've intently tried to develop that you would say has helped you in in this process? Or I don't know if it's uh, um, things that our our students can also leverage going forward. Or what is what has piqued your interest? Or what have you been able to utilize to, to maximize your return or de-risk or leverage risk or get you where you're where you're, where you are right now? Yeah. So uh, let me kind of answer that question in two ways. So first, uh, this the the idea or the kind of uh, 
mental game that I've been playing lately is bringing the idea of a mission mindset. Mission mindset is one of the mindsets that we're taught at the agency, taught in the field, and trying to apply that into uh, everyday life. That in the agency is all inclusive. It's family and and career and security and training and you know it just it's a huge concept. But I realize that there's a there's a market for it in the business world because how many entrepreneurs end up gaining 50 pounds and failing in their marriage because they're trying to make their business work? And how many entrepreneurs end up you know ostracizing their kids because they make their kids think that they love their business more? Everybody's having these struggles maintaining a balance between everything. So I'm trying to find a way to incorporate this mission mindset into business because I feel like to a certain extent, we have been able, my wife, who is also former agency, my wife and I have been able to do this in our business because we brought that mission mindset from CIA. One of the areas where we've seen it succeed, um, and that's the second half of your question, is when it comes to this idea of uh, a very select marketing strategy. So we try to market in such a way that we avoid all mass marketing. And this is something that, you know, if, if uh, this podcast makes its way to any marketing instructors in the MBA program, you know, they're not going to be happy with what I have to say. But in the MBA program, I was taught mass marketing. And that's all I was taught. And maybe that's the marketing classes I chose, whatever. I'm sure it's on me. But my point is mass marketing is this idea that you spend advertising dollars and you can't immediately track the response of which marketing is working and which marketing is not. You just hope that if you spend $100,000 in marketing money, that you sell $200,000 in revenue. And then you're like, oh, that's great. But you don't know exactly which channels are working the best. You don't know exactly which, uh, which modalities or which marketing messages are the most effective. So what I've been trying to do is experiment with what's known as like a magnetic marketing, which is a much more tailored specific marketing technique that's used in entrepreneurial spaces where I every dollar spent in marketing back to a specific dollar of revenue. And if I don't see that return come back, then I can immediately troubleshoot my marketing message, my marketing target market, uh, my timing, my placement, whatever it might be. And it, it lets me identify quickly if I'm finding Paul or if I'm missing Paul, or if my target audience is somebody different, it lets me know very quickly if I'm hitting that target or missing that target. And because of that, I get to focus my resources, focus my attention in a way that's measurable. And then I know, I always feel productive. I always feel successful because even if I miss my audience, I have all the data to show me that I'm missing the audience. There's nothing more frustrating than doing something wrong and you don't know what it is. It's very satisfying to do something wrong and know what you're doing wrong. So that's a little bit of how I bring mission mindset into how we handle our own marketing right now with Everyday Spy. Great tips for us. And to realize that while we, some of us might be majoring or taking marketing classes, we need to, other, to get down to these, we'll say, actionable strategies in these different areas of marketing that may or may not be taught. And we need to be an operational surgeon to know, to make sure that our money is going further than it, or if it needs to go further or how far it's going or if it's not working or what we need to adjust even on a micro level strategy within marketing or operations, et cetera. So wonderful, actionable items that we can take forward. I would like to open the floor to any of the students if they have any questions, thoughts, ideas, or what, what would they like to share or maybe curious to know a bit more uh, from Andy or his, his platform. And if you don't have questions, guys, I'm going to call you out by name and make you ask me a question because I see your names. I have a question. Um, so you've been you've been talking about how like your spy skills apply to business. Um, so like, what are some like persuasion tips you can you can give us for for business? Absolutely. So whenever you're trying to persuade someone, you have to understand that persuasion is not a logic game. It's not based on trying to get someone to do something because they know it's the right thing. It's all about emotions. The world is driven by emotions. The most logical cutthroat person you know is still driven by emotions. So when you're trying to persuade someone to do anything, buy your product, sponsor your product, sell your product on their shelves, understand that there you have to find the emotional trigger that speaks to that person's problem, right? So if, you're, if I'm talking to, locale in downtown St. Pete, right? 
their emotional problem is that they want to feel like they're a high-end grocery store. They want to feel like they're very select and exclusive. They want, they're, they're solving a problem for people in the immediate area who want to feel like they're not just going to Publix, they're not just going to uh, Walmart, they're going to locale, they're going to someplace that's really cool and hip. So if you roll in there and you're talking about, and you're trying to persuade them to, to have your product and you're saying that your product is so, you know, it's well proven, it's been in these five other stores, you're not hitting their emotional triggers. You wanna to go to them and say, hey, this product is exclusive. It's in one or two other stores in these two or three other cities that people in your, in your area can't reach. You want this on your shelf because it's gonna help you make yourself even more exclusive. That's the trick to persuasion is you have to tap on the emotional core, the emotional problem of someone that you're trying to work with. So uh, to build up on that, like what are your tips on like finding that emotional trigger? Oh, that's a great question. Was that Graham? Uh, any conversation business-wise is by asking questions. I teach people that when you ask questions, you are in control of a conversation. Your question, Graham, has, is directing all of my energy right now. And I have spoken like six times as many words as you spoke. So understand the power of questions. So when you're trying to do business with somebody, the best place to start is with a question. How, you know, what are you doing with this? What is your goal with that? I noticed that you posted this recent article and it was great. Where did you, you know, what was one interesting thing that surprised you when you did your research? If you ask people a question, you're immediately disarming them because they're used to hearing people pitch. Everybody out there is used to having someone email them or call them and make an offer. Hey, you want me? Hey, I can help you. Hey, you know, this is your chance to, you know, get in on this great deal. But if you just go in with genuine curiosity, it's really, really hard for people to ignore genuine curiosity. And then every question they answer tells you more information about their problem and their and, and their emotional vulnerability or their emotional uh, kind of soft spot. Awesome. Is there a question limit you can ask? Like, because like when you're talking to people, like eventually they're going to get tired out. Like, is there like a point where it's like not optimal to ask questions anymore? So, yeah, what I do is it's a it's kind of a silly rule, but it's a it's a functional rule when it comes to espionage. You ask two questions and then you confirm on the third statement. So I know it's, it's such a silly recipe, but how is your day? What are you doing? And then I agree with whatever it is that they just said, right? So how is your day? Oh, I'm having kind of a crappy day. It's really stressful. Oh, you know, why is it stressful? Oh, my kids, you know, woke, didn't sleep last night and I'm on my third cup of coffee. Oh, and then you confirm, oh man, it's really tough for me too. Whenever my kids keep me up, I drink so much coffee, it makes me jittery. And then boom, you're right back into the cycle again. Two more questions and then one more confirmation. And what you find is through that cycle, you're building something that we call rapport in the intelligence world. Rapport is nothing more than the perception of a relationship. The person who's answering your questions, if you'll like just track with me here, the person who's getting asked questions feels special because they're sharing information. They don't feel like they're getting pitched. They don't feel like they're getting sold. They feel like they are interesting. And you are the person who makes them feel interesting. So then they want to be around you. And then you start to con like you start to confirm whatever they're saying. You start to confirm however they're feeling. And now they just want to be around you even more. So what happens is within just a few minutes of conversation, they feel like there is a relationship building. And then that relationship is what really converts to them being willing to share with you their pain, their concerns, their priorities, whatever it is that your product solves. And I know that might sound like dirty baseball to some people, but it works. Sweet, we that's practice awesome. a, lot, a lot of soft skills, or we're trying to introduce them as, as a, a skill set that we develop. Because in business school, we we, we, we tend to gloss over it. So that's why we had Christine here. That's why we're, we're building these soft skills, presenting. We constantly are doing pitching, uh, being comfortable with ourselves. So therefore we can enact these types of strategies. So these are wonderful tasks and direct actions that we can build on. That's why we do these soft skill development. That's why we're saying, get out in there, get out in the field, get out and talk to these people, ask them questions, et cetera. 
and and asking questions is a form of interviews, which is a form of primary research, discovery, which is part of the design thinking process, human understanding uh, and building empathy, et cetera. These are why we're learning these skills, why we're learning these phases, why we're learning this methodology. Wonderful. Andy, I, I couldn't be grateful uh, enough for you, you being here. If you had a book that you could recommend or something that has inspired you to level up your game a bit more or something that's provoked you, would you have a, a recommendation for us? Yeah, I've got two actually. So uh, Peter Thiel has a book out there called Zero to One. And I love that book because whether or not you like Peter Thiel, and he's kind of a character that has some connections that you know people don't always agree with, his, his perspective in Zero to One is all about creating the thing that nobody else is creating and taking advantage of, of basically a monopoly because our, our government has built protections so that if you are the first to market or if you are the first to engineer something, you can create a monopoly and it's a legal monopoly. But we can't be afraid of, of trying something new. We can't be afraid of that idea of, uh, of building a monopoly because that's how you're going to scale quickly and make massive gains. So zero to one is a nice short read uh, fantastic educational, like it mixes academia and, and, and uh, practical advice. The other one I would recommend is by Napoleon Hill called Think and Grow Rich. And I know that if you've probably heard this book a thousand times, it's like, I always thought it was like a self-help book and I guess kind of it is. But what blows my mind about Think and Grow Rich is it was written in 1947. And the, and the truths that it speaks to are still relevant today. Everything from your art, your target audience to outwitting your competition, persuasive techniques to how you set up a business and position it to outpace uh, others in the marketplace. It's just an awesome, awesome book. So Peter Thiel, Zero to One, I think it was made and published in like 2014. And then Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich, a book from right after the, uh, the end of the Great Depression. Interesting books. Uh, I'm familiar with Napoleon Hill a bit, and a few people have may have mentioned zero to one or are fr from my circle. But thank you for sharing those. I always ask. I have one more question after this, but um, I always ask our our guests if you could go back to talk to your younger self. What advice would you would you give yourself, and you know what wisdom would you share? If I could go back and talk to my younger self, man, there's a lot of things I would say. But when it comes to business, I would tell them, I would tell myself that, that I am not as important as I think I am. It's really easy to fall into this idea that the world revolves around you, that your experience revolves around you. You're like the star in your own movie. You're trying to get a date this weekend. You're trying to get dinner tonight. You're trying to pass this class. You're trying to whatever, right? Whatever whatever's at the top of your mind right now is an example of you thinking that you are the most important thing. What the agency did for me is it taught me to think the way other people think. And as soon as you stop thinking about yourself and you start thinking about how are other people thinking right now, then all of a sudden it gives you this incredible advantage over everyone around you because nobody else around you is thinking about you. They're all thinking about themselves. So if you can put yourself in the, in the head of someone else, whether it's a future life partner, whether it's a future date, whether it's a professor, whether it's a sales target, whatever it might be, if you can think like they think, then you're going to be one step ahead of them everywhere you go. And if I would have, if I would have learned that lesson that the agency taught me when I was 18, 19, 20 years old, I mean, I would have just dominated in everything I did because I realized I realize now in hindsight how many roadblocks were artificial roadblocks that I built because I was stubborn and thinking about my own needs and my own perspective and my own uh, goals as the number one most important thing. Wonderful. I think it's, would you think, would you agree that it might be challenging to get into that mindset or how could we get into that mindset? Yeah, that it's be in other, other people's mind. Yeah, it's it's challenging, but it's just a matter of uh, it's just a matter of practice, right? So one of the first ways I was taught to practice is whenever I drive, 
anytime you drive somewhere, anytime you ride your bike or walk somewhere, just stop for a second, like mentally pause for a moment and look around. And every other person that you see is also walking or driving or riding a bike from someplace to someplace else. Like, right, just like you, you know, without a shadow of a doubt, I, I'm going from my house to the grocery store. I'm going from my apartment to the gym. And you never stop to think twice about that. But what's that lady across the street doing? Is she leaving her apartment to go to a yoga class? Is she leaving her apartment to walk her dog because her dog was sick last night? Is she going to the pharmacy to get some medicine for her husband? And once you start realizing that every human being around you has their own life, has their own challenges, their own problems, man, you start to really recognize that you can, you can insert yourself and, and control so much more of your environment if you just mentally pause to think about someone else's point of view. And when you layer on top of that, the fact that nobody else is thinking about other people's point of view, it's kind of like taking candy from a, from a baby at that point. They don't know how to share. You're sharing. And now they're just going to eat whatever candy you give them. It's, it's kind of a scary, creepy, but, you know, useful skill. Now for our most important question. James Bond 007 had a special drink and he preferred his martini a certain way. So my question to you is, do you prefer your martini shaken or stirred? <laughs> I never drink a martini because you don't look very masculine with that glass in your hand. Okay. Well, Andy, thank you so much for spending this hour with us. Uh, it's been insightful. Let's do it again. And thank you. Let's give Andy a big round of applause. And we do this in sign language. <laughs> thank you everybody for your time and good luck with your, uh, with your studies. Thanks, man. Thank, thank you. you very much.